Uh, I wanted to play a really quick video, mostly because uh, it's been a long time in the making and I kind of feel like we should put it to use. So it's 90 seconds, obviously hosted on YouTube, so we're all good there. And uh, enjoy. In May of 2014, I sat in a Boston airport with my life sitting next to me and a hulking baby blue roller bag and a one-way ticket to New Zealand in my hand. I had a dream to chase, a jump to make, and someday a book I wanted to write about how and when to go do it. Before I boarded this flight, I asked a stranger to take this video as I spun my racket. I was off to play the professional squash tour. Squash is a niche racket sport. In squash, you spin the racket to start a match. I was beginning to start my own match. My plans were for a few months, maybe three, maybe six. If I was lucky, I figured I could couch surf for the first few weeks, stay with friends, friends of friends, host families, strangers, just so I could experience life for a little bit as they were living it. And then something funny happened. The universe and hundreds of strangers helped make my dream come true. A few months turned into nearly two years, 200,000 miles, six continents, and about 50 countries. In that time, I spent nearly every night with other people, bartenders and fellow bus passengers, single parents to millennials. I slept along farmlands and in skyscrapers, along mountaintops and across villages. I stayed with creators and makers and chefs and teachers, skydivers, farmers, activists, entrepreneurs. Now, four years later, my next dream is coming true. A book of a story made possible by these strangers. A book about when to chase your dreams. A book about when to jump. To the over 400 beautiful humans who gave me a place to stay, a memory to treasure, thank you. Truly, thank you. I've got a couch with your name on it in San Francisco. I did not ever think, and I truly believe this, uh, that, that I'd be standing here talking about this book. And I first want to say thanks to, to Google for having me. I also want to say thanks to Google headquarters in San Francisco. Uh, my roommate, uh, who pushed me to, to see this book through, works at Waze. And it was because of him that I was able to eat on Google's tab three to five days a week. <laughs> <clears throat> Still do, so hopefully this doesn't make its way. It probably will, sorry. Uh, I am not an employee, just a fan of the cafeteria. <laughs> but I, I figured since we're in a smaller group and, and this is one of the last events we'll do on the UK leg of the tour, uh, I'd love to tell just my story and, and a little bit of, of the why and, and what made me want to put these stories together. And then obviously we'd love to, to hear about yours and answer any questions that might, might come up. So backing up a bit, five years ago, I was sitting in my office and I, I picked up a phone and called a woman who I'd been reading about in a magazine on my desk. And the article was about how this woman just competed in the 2012 Olympics here in London. And at the very end of the article, it talked about how she worked in a corporate job before becoming a cyclist. And the rest of the article was about the Olympics and how it felt and all this stuff. And all I cared about was, was that transition of of doing something that probably wasn't expected or, or was a bit of a surprise to her and maybe even a risk. And she ended up picking up the phone, which was pretty weird looking back on it. And her first question was, how'd you get my number? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, I just, I'd love to know what, what led you to take this jump. And what she said over the next 45 minutes, it had nothing to do with being an Olympian or trying to train to become an athlete and everything to do with that voice in her head and conversations with her parents and what it felt like to think of failure and not maybe having a job again if she couldn't succeed at the next thing. And it was funny because earlier that night I had Googled when to chase your dreams. Has anyone ever done that? If you haven't, don't. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll sum it up for you. You get two things. One is a lot of the inspiration and like the feel-good stories. And then on the other side you get the, the Instagram photos, the beautiful LinkedIn posts, the Facebook news feed updates, which you kind of like really don't want to read, but then you end up reading and you're like, ah, my life sucks. How did this person make it? How did this happen so easily? And while all that's great and, and the inspiration certainly there, we're, we're at no lack of it on the internet, what really struck me was that there's a whole middle section of, of doing what you love. And that conversation with these cyclists 
covered what I call these 10,000 unsexy steps that go with chasing your dream, but no one talks about that. You see the beginning and then you see kind of the fairy tale ending, but you don't talk about the restarts, the failures, the insecurities, the hesitations. And to me, sitting in that desk at work, it wasn't really about do I take this jump or not? It was about are there other people who have done something risky, whatever that may be. And so I thought back to 10 years earlier. Uh, I grew up in Southern California. And who here plays squash? Are there any squash players? People? One? OK, that's about average. OK, right? <laughs> Do you know what squash is? OK, that's many, many more than where I grew up. Everyone thought I was harvesting vegetables in the winter. So uh, there was one club within like 200 kilometers of where I grew up. And it had the only courts in those 200 kilometers. And I found it when I was 14 years old. And I thought, someday I'm going to play at the highest level. Does anyone know the Pro Squash Tour? What about you? You're the squash player. Do you know of it? Uh, well, you are uh, in the majority of people who don't know much about the Pro Squash Tour. It's like the Pro Tennis Tour, but the ugly stepchild that no one ever talks about. It's, it's similar. You play by yourself against somebody else, but you don't make any money. And in fact, when you have a tournament that goes through towns like ours in Santa Barbara, the families that are part of the community will host a player. So I signed up our family when I was 14 to host a traveling player. And we had a conversation that would come back to me 10 years later in my office cubicle after speaking to that woman who was the cyclist. Because the, the guy sitting across the table from me as a 14-year-old said, you know, you, you should do this. If you get good enough, you can play on mountains in Brazil and, and cities in Asia and, and go to Europe. I had never been out of the country. And so to me, that was truly surreal to think there was a whole world out there that you could explore. And so I sat with this story from a woman 10 years later saying that you can chase your dreams, but it's going to be pretty tough. And you're not alone in trying to do it. And so I sketched a cover page. And this was five years ago. And I was with my buddy at work named Corey. And we were the last two in the office. Uh, do you guys remember the ice bucket challenge? Yeah. So Corey actually started that for his friend from Boston College named Pete Frades, who has ALS. Corey was this larger than life guy. I said, Corey, this should be a book, but this should be actually a community where you can come together, share what you want to do, have good food, beers, talk about things that you might otherwise feel weird to mention. Maybe it means totally changing everything. And then maybe it's just doing something different on the weekends, learning a new language, volunteering. I had started to collect more of these stories, and it just seemed like whether it was a fellow bus passenger or or Corey next door, or the lady down at the bar, or the receptionist at the front desk. Everyone like, had this little voice in their head. And so I was sharing this woman's story, first anecdotally, and then kind of writing it down and passing it around. And to be honest, the, the reason I said I didn't think I'd ever be here is because I never really, I mean, I guess I sketched a cover page, but I didn't think it'd actually be a book. I thought this would give me permission to tell my parents I'm not totally crazy for leaving a job that I really cared about. Um, I was working at a venture firm. Uh, called Bain Capital. They were here, they're in Boston. I felt like I won the lottery to be in this role. And I felt really kind of selfish to think of doing anything different than what my parents wanted, what my five siblings wanted for me. I felt like it'd be weird to bring up. And yet here was this story that was giving me permission. And so I ended up joining the Pro Tour part time. I spent two years and saved up money. I talked to my friends at work and my supervisor. I said, I think I'm going to do this. And I was not a very good squash player growing up. That's kind of a detail that the book leaves out. Uh, but I wanted to give it a try. And over what I call these 10,000 unsexy steps of listening to the voice and then making a plan and, and saving up and playing tournaments, I actually got to play my first pro tournament while still at Bain, took a sick day. I went down to Virginia. I was playing the world number 90. To give you perspective, I was the world number 387, uh, which may or may not, should not sound impressive, it, especially that you know, if you, are, you know, have an internet connection and pay 100 pounds, you can be the world number 387. It is the last spot on the pro tour. So I had paid the money. I was a pro player. I go down. I'd been training, feeling pretty good about myself. And uh, I didn't score a point in the first match. 
which is actually really hard to do, to not score a point. Um, but I managed to do it. My dad had come down. We kind of looked at each other like, is this the thing you're about to quit your job to go do? Because it doesn't, might not add up. And then after a few more matches and, and a bunch more saving, I ended up leaving Bain. I took that video in the Boston airport and I moved to New Zealand. And I thought three months would be at most the tour. And I'd come back, maybe go to grad school. That seems like what you do when you don't really know what you want to do. Uh, at least to me, that was, that was a safe landing. Maybe if they'd let me back, go back to Bain. Three months turned into six months. The first month of tournaments, there were probably 20 guys there from 32 different countries. And one person passed me off to someone in Brazil and then Australia and then someone who's someone in France and South Pacific. Six months turned into 12 months, turned into two years. And every night but one, I was with other people. And every time I sat down at a dinner table, someone would ask me about how I knew when to jump. And so I'd pull out this one story I had. And I'd say, yeah, I'm going to make this a book someday. Which, like, you know, obviously wasn't really going to happen in my mind. I wasn't an author. And then sadly, my buddy Corey uh, passed away really early on in my trip. And it, it kind of hit me that, you know, we have this much time or we have this much time to go do what we want to do. But we definitely don't have this much time. And part of Corey's legacy was taking an idea and making it something bigger. And so while I was playing squash, I started back on the project. And I got to all different types of people. The second baseman for the Chicago Cubs who left the Cubs to go to college. The first female bishop in the Anglican church who was in PR. Uh, people at tech companies like Google who had actually changed offices, moved continents, stayed within the company, but done something totally different. It really didn't matter what the jump was, but it was, it was showing that there was people that were willing to take it, and there was a community to support that. And so I came back uh, two years after leaving. My parents were like, you really need to get a job now. And I would stay on my buddy's couch uh, in San Francisco. What I figured out was, in most cities in the world, you're unemployed if you're on your friend's couch. Uh, in San Francisco, you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> so I was sitting on my buddy's couch, and it's the end of the year. There's a holiday party that someone invites me to. And I said, sure, you know, I'll just come along. And I'd been working on my stories, started to interview for jobs. And I bring my stories in my backpack, and I, I pull up a seat at this, this holiday party. And the woman next to me, I uh, was supposed to talk, didn't know that at the time. She was the keynote speaker. And she's like, you know, have you, you know what's your story? And I said, well, and I kind of had two decisions. I either tell her the real life thing, like I need a job, running out of money, parents expect me to get a job. Or I could dig into my backpack and show her the stories I've been working on. And so I pull into my backpack and I grab these stories and I'd used like literally uh, some of the last cash that I had saved up on the squash trip to get a graphic designer to make a logo. I had a blog set up. I'd been rejected by every editor I could ever reach out to. And what I told her was, this someday will be a book, and we're going to have these festivals where people can have beers and talk about what they want to do. We're going to have a podcast. We're going to have a learning series. It's going to be about doing what you love in any way. And right now, we're just starting with a blog, but it's going to get there. And she said, well, you should, you should tell these stories by video. And I was like, lady, you know, that's nice. But I'm on my buddy's couch. I got like four weeks left in the bank. And everyone's told me I have to start with a blog. She said, well, you know, if it's helpful, like, I think we could really help you out. We'd love it. My company does video stuff. We could partner together. Just give me, shoot me an email if you'd like. I said, oh, that'd be great. So she hands me her card. And I look down. And it says Ariana Huffington on it. And I said, yeah, you'll be hearing from me. Yeah, I'll, I will reach out to my brand. Yeah. And three weeks later, I played my last squash tournament in New York City. It was my last pro event. And two hours before that, I sat across 15 executives from the Huffington Post. And the first question was, well, is this a brand or just a project? I was wearing the, like, the same thing I got off the tour wearing. I had my backpack. And I look over and I said, oh, it's obviously, a, it's a brand. We are a brand. And they said, well, we'd love to partner with you guys. I said, well, we'll think about that, and we'll let you know. <laughs> and then get in the elevator, and what do I do? But I, I Google, before I get out of the elevator to leave the building, how do you start a brand? 
And three weeks later, I'd met a uh, literary agent. She looked at me, she said, I know people have rejected this, but I think it may not be a book, but it should be a book. And I'm willing to try, try to take this on. And when we started to collect more stories, I think it became apparent that When to Jump wasn't about that big fairy tale ending that you see and moving to Bali and everything just works out. It was about taking agency over these small and big decisions in your life. And there's a lot of books out there on inspiration and self-help and, and do these five things and it'll work out. And I, I just think that's not how life works. Uh, it's funny, um, probably three weeks after we launched our partnership with HuffPost and our brand began, uh, I was invited to partner with Airbnb. And at this point, I was just getting off my buddy's couch. I told Airbnb we'd be thrilled to partner with them. <laughs> and they had a, a member festival that Ashton Kutcher and Gwen Paltrow were also speaking at. And they said, why don't we start our collaboration with you, you know, sharing the stage? I was like, can I get an autograph? Or is that weird? Like, I'm a huge Kutcher fan. Anyway, uh, I said, yeah, yeah, we'll, our, we have a platform. We can come share that platform with you. And also, if you spend enough time in Silicon Valley, you just throw platform in any sentence possible. And so I go down to LA and my parents came. They're sitting in the first row and doors hadn't opened yet. And they came because we all figured it might just be them. And that's totally cool. You can always tell people I got to partner with Airbnb. And the talk was about how you can use Airbnb to, to make a jump. It turns out that one in four hosts use Airbnb to save up money to go do something different. So the door is open and we ended up with 2,500 people in the audience. Now, I had already made a slideshow then, and I had expected it to be, you know, my parents and maybe a few friends. And so at the very end of the slideshow, I actually had an email address that went to me, but was this uh, email to our platform. And I said to folks in the audience, you know, here's this email. Send your jump for next year to our platform, and we will follow along in what you're doing, because we have a very you know, throughout AI and smart learning and big data, like blah, 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 and we'll follow up with you. And I remember looking down at my phone afterwards, and of course, all these went to me. So I opened my phone, it went from one in the inbox to 700. And that weekend, I looked over 700 emails, and the crazy thing was, almost all, I think all but maybe 15, had nothing to do with, with changing your career. It was the little things. It was like, I want to have uh, a family and also pursue a career. I want to have more time for my kids on the weekends. Uh, I've always wanted to go to France. So people were using the hosting income to make money, and now they were thinking of this concept of jumping as like, I want to control the time I have in my day. And I know that sounds probably contrived or cliche, but to me, like, I, I truly thought we'd never get to talk to companies because you might read the book title and be like, well, won't everybody leave? And now I, I can tell you, I mean, we, we reached 3 million people in our first video with HuffPost. We've been fortunate that the, the festival concept has grown and, and we're going to actually bring it to London this year. Uh, we reached millions of people through our community and platform and hopefully this book. And very few of the jumps are actually about changing everything in your life. You know, people say chase your passion. I think that's really awkward and weird to have to like think about at lunchtime. Um, I'm all about taking these little steps and finding that one or two things that kind of starts to change your day. And so today, like I said, the, the platform is platform, uh, which by the way, I got a lot of feedback from Airbnb. Fortunately, it was positive. We were with them yesterday, uh, but the most common point of feedback was, wow, you know, people really felt like even though it was AI, they were talking to a human on the other side of the screen. <laughs> and I was like, I, yeah, I'll have to tell our engineers, great job. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was like, dun, 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 me, <laughs> throwing out emails. And so now we, we have a little bit more behind the platform. Uh, we're on whentojump.com. We started a podcast where every, every Tuesday we have a 30-minute conversation with, with anybody. It could be someone who moved within a company. It could be someone who moved around the world. Uh, my favorite conversations are with people like this gentleman last night in London. 
who absolutely loves flowers. And his jump is on the weekends, he brings his skills to events and he uses flowers to bring them to life. He's still a project manager, he works down the street from here, but that's his passion. And so we get enough of those kind of data points and we're now rolling out a directory where if you're a project manager turned flower guy in London, Later this year, you'll be able to go and start typing, like, who else is a flower person? And if you're traveling in Chicago for work and you love baking, you can look up people who have jumped into baking and find those people. Uh, we're actually doing a private kind of build up for that. So if you, if you want to help me out on that, you can come find me because it's going to start small. But we think that someday there'll be a festival somewhere in the world, like in London this fall. There'll be more books like this. Uh, there'll be companies like Google that support that idea. I think it's what is it, Area 120 that you guys have, where people can actually take the full risk of jumping and not actually have to sacrifice so much on paper. You know, I wish I had that. I wasn't so lucky in where I worked. I was lucky they supported it, but it was pretty much all or nothing. You know, there are organizations now that support the idea of jumping because if you do it right, you actually have a meaningful career and you don't have to leave. Uh, we, we didn't have that at where I worked, uh, but I think that's the way the workforce is going. And so we hope we're creating that community uh, through the podcast, through the book, through this directory, through bringing people together. Um, and I think we're just getting started. Um, so with that, I want to thank you guys for having me. I'll stick around for Q&A uh, and be here afterwards to sign books. Uh, but I hope this kind of touches on the real story behind the book, and I appreciate you guys letting me come and tell it. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we have about 15 minutes for Q&A. So if anybody would like to ask a question, um, we need to pass around this microphone. But I'll start off by asking, for people who aren't 100% sure what their passion is, but they know they want to explore something, whether it be more creative, more engineering focused, maybe their own startup, how do they discover that passion? while also moving along this sort of journey? Like I said, I think that, I think social media and pop culture really kind of overblows this like, you know, find your passion, follow it. It's not like finding sugar at the grocery store. You know, it's like, those things take time. Um, you need to kind of first, I think, consider what makes you curious. And, and there's a story in the book from a fitness entrepreneur, and he has a great, uh, kind of piece of advice. It's actually about training and being in the gym. And he says, you know, a lot of people, especially in the new year, say, I want to get fit. And then he says, show me how you spend your time and I'll show you what your priorities are. Because most people say, I'd love to get fit, but then they don't go to the gym. Or they don't work out. Okay. And I think it's the same about, you know, what do you like to do outside of work? Or if you want to become an engineer, are you, are you spending time towards that thing? And if you don't know what it is, I would just say, okay, take a morning and look at what you did the day before and see what what got your attention, where you started spending time, what you were Googling on after work. Okay. And I think from there you start to pull threads. But for me, it, you know, this was never, this was a hope that we could bring the message out, but I think when to jump came out of being like, okay, I just want to collect stories. And then from that, other things started to evolve. Okay, um, and the second question before I open it up to the floor. Um, there's a massive nervous around, nervousness around that moment why you're deciding to jump right through to actually jumping. Can you give any advice to everyone who's thinking about a transition right now, ways to approach it, mindset to take, you know, do you just go for it or do you really consider it, take three months? What's your advice on that? I don't know if this is weird to preface, but I don't consider myself a self-help guru or like, you know, qualified to give everybody advice on their life. I think everyone lives a, a life that's very complicated and specific to yours. And I can only reflect on like the research we've done around the book and, and being, um, being lucky to spend time with people who have taken the steps to kind of think through their jump. Um, for me, it's, it's, it's how the book's organized. So um, there's four kind of phases that it seems like anyone goes through when they make a, a jump in their life. Uh, the first is listening to that little voice. The second one is making a plan, which is I think the bulk of it. These like 10,000 unsexy steps. Okay. Um, that includes kind of sewing a safety net in your current job, especially if you're looking to I think move internally it seems like doing the job you're doing really well and getting a lot of support around that, building a good kind of reputation is, is a 
you know, good kind of foundation to jump from. And then there's letting, letting yourself be lucky. So once you've actually planned the jump and you've, you've solved for all you can solve, I don't think there's ever a perfect time to go, but I think you've set yourself up to run into you know, fortuitous opportunities. And I think that's probably my favorite section of the book is hearing about people who just trusted your gut. And that's, by the way, really hard. But I think, you know, to your question, if, if you do the other things, by the time you actually jump, there isn't as much of a downside. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. But anyone would like to ask a question? It's a very open question. Cool. So I I'll give a really I'm open just, answer. Yeah, it's like, uh, what's your, I have read many books and they're mostly from Americans. And when you try to apply them in UK, it sometimes doesn't work, it mostly doesn't work. So since you've been around and you've been in New Zealand, etc., how do we localize stuff like from your book or what we read around? Yeah, so the book has 44 stories that represent, I don't think, the, the viewpoint of one nationality. There's a really strong immigrant thread through the book uh, from Chinese Americans to El Salvadorians to Nigerians. Uh, we have several folks in the book from the United Kingdom. And then we have people in the book that I just met while I was traveling. People from, from New Zealand through Asia and, and here in the, or there in the States. Um, what I find really interesting, maybe this isn't the answer to the question, but uh, I think that there's something fundamental to how you think about what you do every day. I think we, we constantly as humans, you know, it's part of being human, wondering like, is this the way I'm supposed to be spending my time? I think that's the core of the book is it's not so much, oh, jump because it's a cultural thing or you're a millennial. You know, we have a woman who's 67 years old who's in the book. Uh, we have a single mom in Boston. We have an Indian woman in Guilford. Uh, the, the powerful part to me is that given all the disparities, there's just fundamental truths that come out of this, this idea that we think about. Um, and maybe it won't, it's actually, I mean, it's going great in the States, but we've had an amazing reception here, I think, because maybe there isn't as much of a conversation openly about like going off the path. Uh, we were at, we did an event with Lululemon, and one of the, the panelists was this Indian woman from Guilford who is in a career and worked in fashion on the side and ended up going into a career in fashion. And we spend most of the time talking about British culture and, and kind of traditional cultures where that's not what your parents did, that's not what your friends are doing, what that means if you're culturally not supposed to do that. So I think we do a decent job of sharing those types of stories. Um, we also have these festivals where we try to go into different areas. London will be our first one this September. Um, Abby's with me, she's our event director, she's back there. If you're interested in like being a part of it or if you think there's things we should know as we plan it, I'd be thrilled because we're spending this week kind of getting going. And we also want to do something special for everyone at Google if they end up wanting to come. But I think it's important to like go there and learn the stories and be there. And I was lucky that Squash gave me that kind of excuse to sit down and have thousands of these conversations. But I'm sure there's stuff we're missing and, and maybe that's, that's for the next book, I don't know. <laughs> And by the way, as we pass it on, my email, if you just email info at whentojump.com, that goes to our platform, which uh, I can promise you will come to me almost immediately. Uh, and just say you want info on the London event, and we'll make sure you're on the, on the list. And um, Abby's email is just abby at whentojump.com. But like truly, this is day two of thinking about what we'll do in September. So welcome all ideas and feedback. Uh, I have two questions in one. Is it working? Yeah. Um, so the name of the book is when to jump, not if to jump. So it kind <laughs> of implies a positive outcome. So is it really always positive? And I'm assuming that the 44 stories in the book, since they made it to the book, are positive. So what is the most blissful failure you've seen and what do you actually define as a failure in this case? So y your assumption is actually incorrect, which is, I think, a good thing. Um, the fourth phase of this jump curve is don't look back. And that's kind of code for being like, the stories that didn't really go the way they thought. And I think that's important because it'd be a little weird to just show you 44 stories where it just all was exactly as planned. Um, we had both internal jumps that kind of didn't go as planned as well as people who took a big risk and it didn't work out. Um, to me, and again, maybe this is just super optimistic, but from, from every conversation I've had since five years ago talking to that cyclist, the people who took the time to take that 
that middle ground of planning and thinking and budgeting, all the stuff that's really like not that riveting to talk about or share on Facebook and all that stuff. If you went and did that, those people who's ended up, you know, jumped and it didn't really work out, it led them to something else that might still not be working out, but is getting them closer to what they want to be doing. So no one that I've talked to who's followed kind of this framework, if you will, these phases, has regretted the decision. And in fact, when I was taking the jump, I sought out people who's like fell on their face, jumped and like nothing worked. And they were the biggest advocates and the loudest cheerleaders. And I would challenge you to, to do the same if you're thinking about if rather than when. Like talk to the people who, and I call it, there's three types of people you should talk to. One, a Switzerland who has like no, you know, total bias in one way or the other. Like not the person who's the massive jumper and not your parents who really don't want you to do it. But Switzerland. And then find the, the missed, which is like the person who missed the opportunity and didn't jump. Because that's another theme is if you really want to go do what you're doing and you're worried about if you should do it, talk to the people who, who, who missed that chance because that, that'll probably get you going. And then three would be the, the oops, which is the person who's jumped didn't exactly go as planned. And I would say, say that that would be a first easy exercise to just find those types of people, the three folks, and see what they have to say because I think you'd be surprised. I think the human psyche is one where we, we go to the worst possible place in our mind. And it, that's not always very fair. Thanks. Thanks. Hey. Um, so I think uh, a lot of people, I don't know, in different organizations in so society were um, encouraged to focus on our strengths. And I think it's easier to make a jump if you're going from like a strength to another strength. But in the case of like, if you wanted to go from uh, to something that you were weak at, like I'm thinking when you said you were um, when you jumped to squat uh, to squash, like it's not something that you were um, that you were strong at. Just advice between the two the two different jumps, something that you're strong at, and then something that you're weak at. Yeah, there's a great there's a story in the book about a woman who was at LinkedIn and jumped internally from like a research role to sales, and she really was not a salesperson had studied kind of hardcore analytics in school, but had always wanted to work with, with people on the external side. And I think it's, you know, it comes down again to being like, who's doing the thing that I want to be doing? And will they let me have like 30 minutes with them? Can I buy them a cup of coffee? And just like going at that weakness until, and this sounds cliche, but until that becomes the thing that you've, you feel like you know better than your current job. And I think the hard part, at least it was for me at Bain, maybe for you guys at Google, is once you get in that spot where you feel really like you know how everything works, it almost, it's like, a, 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 like an all or nothing thing. It's like, I can't leave this because then I won't know anything about the other thing. And if you can kind of always be on that edge of your seat, even if you're doing like for eight hours a day, the thing you're supposed to do, but at lunch you go take like a programming course or you talk to the person who's doing what you want. Like that stuff, I think if you, if you feel like it gets into a routine and it's, it's like a, there's a circularity to your day, and your job, I think that's like a signal that you know you're coasting maybe more than you you probably want to. But maybe that's what you need to. Like, there's a spectrum of I think the jump curve is like a spectrum. If you've just you know had a third child or you've got student debts to pay back or a mortgage, like I wouldn't say that you need to jump just then. But you can be having those chats of what you want to do. You can be planning, and then at some point there will be an opportunity I think to do it. It just I mean no one in the book jumped the next day. It was like months, if not some people waited two years, five years to do it. So I know that wasn't exactly what you asked. But no, I think it's along the path. Oh, yeah. sweet. I think I can do without. Oh, I think they need recording. that though for the. Oh, they need yeah. it. OK. Um, curious to, to know if, uh, well, first of all, thanks. Thanks for, for sharing your story. Very courageous and very inspiring. Um, I'm curious to know whether. Uh, through the 44 stories that are in the book and perhaps the, the other stories that didn't make it, did you find any common traits in, in, in the personality of people? Would you say, you know, if they have a couple of things common, you know, people talk about the whole range, you know, discipline, visionary, whatever. I wonder if you, if you picked on any commonality across. To be honest, them. I think that my whole thesis with the book and what I feel like drives me to do this is that I think we we tend to just find like these these buzzwords and we feel like 
we have to only give them to some people, and then we feel like the other people just weren't born with those traits. And the whole point of this book and the community is that we celebrate like the person you walk by in the tube or going for coffee and their jump. And I actually think there's nothing that the people have in common except for this feeling that as you get a little bit more into thinking of what you want to do, this equation starts to go unbalanced where it goes from, well, it could be really bad if I did it and it's not worth doing it, to saying, okay, there's a, there's a worst case scenario of going and that's terrifying. But each of the people in the book would, would show you and in their stories you'll see that idea of not trying ultimately is way more terrifying. And so I don't think there's like a special like, you know, superpower. Um, I think it's this realization of if you peel back the layers, at some point you're going to see this worst case scenario isn't as bad, especially if you're at a place like Google. And if you end up jumping outside of Google, don't blame me. Uh, you can if you want. But I think that it, it goes for anything. Like if you want to change jobs within the company, there's so much more at stake for them to keep you and find the right role for you. And maybe if it doesn't work, find a different role than to go outside and take a chance on a stranger. Like just if you, if you think of human resources and human capital, like you guys made it into the circle. You should feel like you've got all the launching pad you have and, and all the risk opportunity to take because you're already there. Uh, Thank you. I, and by the way, I wish I had a key card because I would, like, if you're enjoying the meals, just keep going because I <laughs> really wish that I had that these days. Maybe a 401k too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question was quite similar to that one, but with a bit of a twist. So um, you've spoken quite a lot about, you've used the word risk quite a lot. And um, obviously there's a lot of conversation about gender and men and women and the differences and I think kind of almost probably over discussed. But um, something that everyone's talking about quite a lot is that women are probably just less sort of uh, inclined to take risks, they're more risk averse. Um, it doesn't sound like that played out, but did you see anything like that in kind of your research? So the second story in the book, the first story is about a karate school manager who wanted to be a screenwriter uh, and failed a bunch of times and then tried one more time and ended up writing Sleepless in Seattle. And then the second story is of a 44-year-old woman and mother, single mother, who left uh, her job as a nurse to become a doctor. And I think in her story, it definitely reflects the like, unique challenges that, that women face different than men in taking a jump. Uh, she was told early on that she wasn't the type of person that could go to college. Um, she then had a child and had to care for the child and couldn't do both as a single parent. Um, so I think there are, and I'm not the expert, I would say speak to, to women who have jumped, um, but like from the data it just seems like there are, there are obstacles, not insurmountable ones, but obstacles you have to feel like, um, okay, I know, I know what I'm going to have to overcome. Um, but I don't think it's as, again, it, as literal and as tactically challenging as we may make it seem. And there's women in the book who, who jumped with kids, who jumped uh, going through a divorce, who jumped uh, planning to have a family, like things that you'd think would be kind of end all be all stopping jumps. Um, and they were able to do it. So there's a bunch more in the book of like how they went and did that, but I would say it's not as insurmountable as it may seem. And our, our audience, by the way, and community members are more than, uh, more than half are, are women who have jumped, so. Um, I have a question. Yep. How did you get the Olympians number? It's a great question. No one's asked that. Well, I noticed. I uh, wait for no, no one's asked that ever before. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, but yeah, yeah. I'd like to know. Um, I have a really funny side story to that, too, that um, I feel like I should just tell. So um, she had went to my university, and then I had a friend who knew a friend of hers because they were – she was five years ahead of me, which is another, like the reason we're making this directory is it shouldn't be that difficult, and I was really lucky that I knew somebody. Um, but she's someone who would take anybody's call. No one had asked her about that. When I got to the second baseman for the Cubs, he, you can Google it, he had just done a piece in the New Yorker. He had just done a piece in the New York Times. And I was living in Zimbabwe at the time, Facebook messaging him. And do you guys know when you're not a Facebook friend where those messages go? Yeah, to like the weird box. Like, yeah. No one should respond. Like, it's just not even, I don't think, a thing. And I think I emailed him like six times to that inbox. And finally, he was like, I want to be able to tell this story of, of when you shouldn't jump. Because he had jumped at the wrong time, and he had to go back to baseball and all these things. Um, to, uh, to tell you the funny story, um, 
we uh, like just we started partnering with Soul Cycle, which I know is in the states, not here, but it's like the spinning whatever. And when I came back to the U.S. and we started working with Soul Cycle, I tracked down the cyclists. I was like, can we, can we like you know hang out? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, I mentioned in passing that we started partnering with Soul Cycle. She's like, oh, like I'd love to go. I've never gone. I was like, this is like a sports center commercial. Like, here's a woman who's a two-time Olympian. She just finished in Rio. And so we go in, and uh, we had just done a talk with them at SoulCycle. And we go into this class, and I'm like next to the Olympian. She's fastening her shoes that she had in Rio. And I'm like, don't freak out. I'm like, don't. And the instructor's like, is Mike Lewis here? And she's like, is that you? And I was like, no, 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 don't worry about it. Like, not me. And they're like, no, no, no. We need to all give Mike Lewis a hand for coming in here because when to jump is gonna change everyone's life. And everyone had to give me a round of applause and she's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> uh, but she's become a friend, so oh. yeah. First of all, thank you for Google uh, to put this on, if you can give a round of applause. I really appreciate you doing this. Um, if I don't get to chat today, if you wanna learn more, like I said, um, info at whentojump.com will get to me. Uh, we have the directory and we have the festival. Abby's just A-B-B-Y at when to jump. Um, and I really hope this is helpful. I hope it's interesting. Uh, tell your friends, and, and thanks so much for coming.